My name is Josh Miller. I own Riverstone Kennels, and I've been training gun dogs for more than 16 years. I have field trialed, I've hunt tested, but at the end of the day, I'm a duck hunter. You might find that the duck in our Duck Dogs podcast is spelt uniquely. The UK stands for my British labs. I love my British labs. I love what they offer me, both as a part of my family and the high motor in the field. As you're going to find, I have some pretty special dogs. Follow along in our podcast series here as we talk about both in the field hunting and in the field training situations that will hopefully help you progress with your dog at home. Welcome back again, everybody, to another episode of Duck Dogs. We are finally back home and catching up on uh, being gone from uh, at the Pheasant Ranch. Have a, a lot to catch up on there, but uh, I think we have a cool topic that we're going to go over here today as we head into the spring training season and we talk about you specifically as a handler. And so I think uh, an interesting, interesting topic here. So um, before we get going with this, I want to make sure we thank our wonderful sponsors. Thank you to Yukonuba. Yukonuba Premium Performance Sport 3020 is the blend of food that I feed my dogs here at the kennel. And um, my dogs here uh, as we're performing not only through the, the training season, but also through the hunting season. Uh, just have had fantastic performance out of our dogs from coat to energy level to recovery time. Just across the board. Can't say enough good things about it. So www.yukonuba.com. Dot com. Also, thank you to Gundog Supply. Gundog Supply is your one-stop shop for all of your hunting and training needs for your four-legged hunting partner. Um, as you go into training season, make sure you stock up on all of your training equipment, whether that's place boards or bumpers or whistles or what have you. www.gundogsupply has you covered. Gundogsupply.com. Uh, thank you to Lucky Duck. Lucky Duck is your five-star crash test rated kennel, both in the intermediate and in the large size. So no matter how big or small your hunting partner is, you can be sure that they're traveling as safe as they possibly can. Uh, also, as we head into the season, don't forget about the kennel fan. Don't mess with the heat. Make sure they stay nice and cool. www.luckyduck.com. Also, thank you to Sitka Gear. Sitka Gear is your premium option for outdoor clothing. We know how great Sitka is as you're out hunting. But as we head into training season, uh, make sure to check out the everyday wear. It will keep you more comfortable and out in the field for longer, whether it's staying dry on those rainy days or uh, just more comfortable on those uh, those summer mornings, www.sitkagear.com. Also, thank you to Kent Cartridge. Kent is our shotgun shell of choice. Uh, we just got done uh, shooting the upland loads, and now we're going to head into the blanks as we head into our training season. Uh, so make sure to go check out Kent Cartridge for your hunting loads and also your blanks as you head into training season. Last but not least, thank you to Retriever Roadmap. Retriever Roadmap is your go-to option for training your own dog at home with step-by-step videos to guide you through the process, to a fantastic community, to uh, events to, to go to, to strike teams to have your own private training groups. There are so many great things uh, going on in Retriever Roadmap. I cannot love, I uh, could not love that uh, community anymore. And uh, right now, we are doing our uh, spring promotion, so our Retriever Roadmap spring promotion, and that is we are waiving the $200 initiation fee to get into that program and uh, just want to get as many people in there as we possibly can. So it is free to get into that program. You just go in and, uh, and have your monthly due. So uh, www.retrieveroadmap.com, make sure you go take advantage of that because, quite frankly, it's the best, best uh, promotion we've ever ran on that thing. So www.retrieveroadmap.com. Well, we are finally back in the studio here, and uh, I'm joined remotely uh, by Mr. Brett Ayers, and uh, we are going to go over quite a few things here as we kind of decompress from, uh, we're decompressing from a lot of things. We're decompressing from waterfowl season, we're decompressing from uh, our upland season at the uh, at the uh, Pheasant Ranch, and then also from our Strike Force event, which is, if you don't know what Strike Force is, it is our big events uh, that we hold for Retriever Roadmap to where Anybody and everybody can come on and uh, just be uh, be present. Any member can come, and it's a big training day. We have a lot of fun. It's you know great progress. I fly in uh, your know, friends from overseas. You know Lewis from overseas. We can be a part of that thing, and it's just a lot of great training scenarios. A lot of great uh, you know just fellowship and friendship. A lot of great uh, opportunities for your dog, and so we're decompressing from that as well. And so I I just got Lewis on an airplane. Uh, going back home uh, to Scotland, I wish we could have got a uh, 
a podcast done with him here, although you may have only been able to understand what half of it, <laughs> but, um, he, uh, he, you know, he just didn't have the time. We had a lot of things. We we're trying to check off, uh, the box here where, you know, he shot his first coyote, his first raccoon, his first armadillo, his first, like he, he got a lot of first out of his way as we traveled around, um, around the different States trying to get that stuff done. So, um, a lot of fun things, but, uh, now we're back into work mode. So Brett, thank you for taking the time here to decompress with me today. Yeah, absolutely. It's always a, it's always a good time to jump on here and, and chat about what we've been up to and, it's been a grind, you know, these last few months. So it's uh, nice to be home and kind of, like you said, decompress and get some things done, get caught up and get back in the training. Yeah, no doubt. Well, so you specifically were at the pheasant ranch with me for basically its entire day. I think you only missed maybe one, one hunting group that we had in this year. And, um, you know, kind of give me a quick breakdown of, you know, the pheasant ranch, kind of what your thoughts were and uh, maybe some of, you know, whether there were highs and lows or just kind of give us a, a quick recap of it for you. Yeah, I guess uh, one word that describes just the experience of being there is just a blast. I had a lot of fun. I talked to a lot of people, you know, that were there or even outside of it. You know, I've just never been really an upland guy. I've been uh, you know, very waterfowl centric and my dad's tried to get me to go to a few game farms growing up and just like I said, I'm a waterfowl guy. Well, I can tell you uh, the little yellow dog that I had out there, Timber, she really changed my perspective uh, of that. And uh, she really just thrived in the upland field. And I, I feel bad for, you know, just being that waterfowl centric, not realizing that there was more for her to do than just retrieve bucks. And she just absolutely had a blast. And it was fun to see that. And then, Obviously, all the clients coming in, uh, got to meet a lot of people, spend a lot of time with people, and, you know, some people that had never hunted before to, to people that, that hunt all the time, and uh, it was just a ton of fun, very thankful to be part of it, and I'm looking forward to the next season. Yeah, I, I, I would echo a lot of that. I think, um, you know, the dogs and the people made it worthwhile. I don't think I can remember a single hunt where it was the number of birds, you know, that we shot or the number of birds we had contacts with, but it was certainly the people and the dog work and was fun about it to me. Probably the most fun from a dog standpoint that I had was the retriever roadmap, you know, group that came in for the hunt um, because so many of them have worked so hard with their dogs. And it was just a pleasure to have, you know, three or four client dogs, not our dogs, client dogs in the field. They're all under control they're all doing things like you know, I think we had one group that every one of them, almost every one of them was, you know, sit to flush, you know, send down their, like the whole thing was just a fun thing to watch. And, um, you know, I, I think that was probably my high for me, my low, which I think is, is an interesting peek behind the curtain on this thing is, and I have a tremendous amount of respect, uh, for anyone that we have, you know, I know, you know, Brett, you and I both have, uh, quite a few friends in, uh, the guiding, you know, space and, you know, whether that's, you know, our buddies at Falco or at Stewart Ranch or, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm sure I have some that I'm missing off the top of my head here, but um, there, there is a mega grind that comes with um, guiding and uh, your, our buddy Cole, who has a, a Brock puppy, yeah, I would hear him talk about it every once in a while and, you know, waterfall guiding is even more different or even I think another layer than the open stuff because there's the guiding and there's the, the permission and there's the spread setup and everything. But the, the, I'd say the, the toughest thing that I had to deal with was matching the energy of each group that came in. Right. So if we're on day 12 or 15 in a row, the guys that are coming in, it's their day one. Right. And then they, they're excited to be there. They've looked forward to this. Their energy is at a high, like you can't come in kicking rocks and you can't come in, going like, oh, like, uh, like, oh, this is 15 days in a row for me, and I'm so tired, I'm so, because they're not. And um, this is where I appreciate you, and I appreciate, you know, your, you know, mental approach to things, because I think you and I, you know, we're, we fed off of each other in those moments, and we just knew, like, hey, like, we just, we pick each other up where we have to, and we, we you know, put on the best show that we possibly can, and it was easier than I thought it would be. It, it still was the most difficult part for me, 
but it was easier than than I think it would have been otherwise because we just had so many great people there. Like if we were going in and these people were not people that we'd want to be around, not people we wanted to hang out with, to spend time with in the field, to spend time with at dinner. Okay, maybe a different story, but these were all just such great people. Like I can't think of a single person that that came through camp this year that, I mean, I wouldn't want to sit down and get to know even better. And uh, I think that was a big part of it for me, but I loved I loved that camaraderie side of it. Um, but it is an interesting, you know, a little tidbit because I hear all the time people talk about like, oh, like, you know, you know, guiding would be just the the dream job. And I mean, I totally, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think I've had that much fun in consecutive work days, maybe ever, right? Like it was just, it was fun day after fun day after fun day after fun day. It was fantastic. Um, but, you know, there is a challenge with that. Like, you have to be the right personality. You have to be able to, to handle that. And so that was probably the most difficult part, you know, for me, even though it really didn't feel that difficult. Yeah. No, I, w- I would agree. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was always nice having that, you know, that small little break between the groups. You know, when the groups left and then the next group come in, we kind of, we could go, we shed hunted, you know, just kind of unwound and kind of regrouped ourselves. And then when that next group come in, it's like, as soon as we go in and do introductions, it was, you know, that switch would come right back on. Like, man, this is going to be fun. This is going to be a fun group. And, you know, we were right back in the work mode and happy, cheery, and uh, ready to ready to entertain for a few days. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. I, I will say that some of uh, some of the, the drag was a little self-induced because ever what, once I got that thermal set up, I mean, we spent all night driving around, <laughs> finding coyotes, finding <laughs> raccoons, finding it was that was a blast. But um, you know, when you got to be up at you know at four forty five the next morning, you know, staying out till one o'clock in the morning, you know, playing with a thermal and trying to see what you can call in, you know, with the uh, the lucky duck call. I mean, that was it, it was it, but it, it also made it fun and made it memorable. And um, there was a lot of cool stuff. I I mean, I probably my my the most fun night that we had there was. Uh, for me was when we had Lewis and Lewis wanted to shoot a coyote in the absolute worst way. And, um, you know, just him, he just had a string of bad luck and, you know, he's just like, you know, he, he was trying getting the shooting down and like, you know, the shooting and like, you know, he's talking a million miles an hour. And I mean, just like, we're all crying, <laughs> laughing. It was just, it was a blast. So, um, a lot, a lot of fun things there, but, but I really want to, I want to transition to kind of the, the meat of our conversation here, which is, um, is the handler. And the reason I wanted to, to talk on this specifically today is I feel like this is opportunistic as we go into training season to talk about the significance as you as the handler. I think it's a good uh, mental approach as you go into like, what's my role? What's my responsibility? What do I have to own? How do I have to approach you know, myself as I head into this training season? But also, I feel like we have a lot of this fresh in our mind from watching people handle their dogs over uh, over the pheasant season, watching people handle their dogs over the waterfall season, watching do- people handle their dogs uh, at strike force. You know, we've just seen so many people recently handle their own dogs that I think it's an interesting topic. And, and I think um, we have a lot of really good examples that I kind of want to dig into a little bit. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of have, I'm going through the same thing myself. And so I, I can kind of tell you guys, you know, from my standpoint, um, you know, some feelings that I have, it's, it's a little different, you know, arena, but it's the same, same approach that I'm taking on this thing. So I think it's, it's an interesting topic, but, um, but, you know, specifically, you know, w- the first thing I want to start into this uh, is, you know, from, from the handler standpoint, um, you know, Brett, when you, when you look at, at the handlers in general, um, what would you say? And we have not, just so everyone knows, we have not prepped for this. So, Brett, you're either going to you know, really make me happy of, of giving me the answers I'm hoping you're going to give me or you're going to like really go the other way. So, um, of all the people you talk to, what level of dog do you think the majority of people you talk to, you know, what, what do you think the majority of the people you talk to, what level of dog do they want to end up with as the end goal? Would you say, you know, uh, you know uh, started an intermediate or an advanced level dog? I think most people want to end up with an advanced level dog, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yep, um, I would agree. Everybody wants to be able to have that dog under control. You can send on a long blind. Most of the stuff, that dog's going to turn 
turn around and look at you right now, give them a cast, take that cast and get to the reward and come back. And I mean, to me, that would should be everybody's end goal, you know, and, and the, the excitement and the reward of, of you teaching your dog to do that. I mean, that's fun to, fun to watch in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm going to follow that up with, cause I agree with you. I think the majority of people that we encountered this year have that as a goal in mind and everyone's level of advance is going to be a little different as far as uh you know some people's level of advanced is all this there's so much perception right so like your level of advance might be i want to run a 300 yard blind where you uh you know tom smith's you know level of i i don't actually have a Tom Smith in mind. I'm just, you know, throwing a name out there. So, but Tom Smith over here, his, his level of advanced, you know, is I just want to be able to, you know, to stop my dog and cast them left or left, right or back. And then you have, you know, Bobby Wales over here that his level of advance is, I just want the dog to bring the bird all the way back to me. So, but the level of advance that we're talking about is, is advanced handling, right? So you have total control, you can stop that dog, you can, you cast them any way you need to, you can send them on a line, you know, for a blind retrieve, um, you know, from an upland standpoint for those upland hunters, you know, uh, sit to flush, not breaking on the shot, send on, on the name, uh, you know, that's kind of the, what encompasses, you know, the other side of that, which we do have uh, coming in Retriever Roadmap. We should probably note that. I haven't talked about that yet. We do have that segment here. Is it up yet, Brett? 75% of it is up, correct. Yep. Okay, so we're, yeah, I mean, it's already starting to be up, which is great. But with all that being said, Brett, in your opinion, what was the number one thing that you saw that people needed to do better at with their dog or needed sharpening up? What was the one thing you're like, gosh, they really need to work on blank? Obedience. 100%. You, you, you made me so proud. You made me so proud with the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, that's the number one key to, to anything, you know, and talking to in the Retriever Roadmap community, a lot of times when people come with questions and they start, you know, dig, we start digging into what they're having issues with, it usually comes down to obedience. And, you know, through the groups that came through, you know, that's that's what we saw a lot, just going back to obedience. And, uh, you know, I think people that were there, especially, you know, through the Pestle Ranch and at um, and a strike force. Uh, I know walking through the, the the UK style trial that we did on Sunday, there was a lot of people that came up to me and said, "Man, that was a fun that was a fun time." But I need to go back to obedience. Mm-hmm. So that's well, and, and what that's I, what I saw. Yeah, and and I, I couldn't agree more with you. And I I kind of baited you into that, but I'm glad that we we're on the same page. It would have completely took this conversation a different way if you had a different perspective. Um, but I totally agree. And I feel like, especially in Retriever Roadmap, I feel like we, to be honest with you, I'm I'm nervous to talk about it a whole lot more because I feel like I talk about it so much already. But obedience is everything. And when you talk about a dog that's wanting to break, it's obedience. When you talk about a dog that is not sitting on the whistle during your advanced work, it's obedience. When you talk about a dog that you don't have control over, it's obedience. And when I talk about control, it's at a distance. You know, I mean, everything comes back to obedience. And it's the one thing that I continue to see people want to rush through. And it's the one thing that I feel like I continue to see people make excuses for why their dog isn't doing something. So, for example, at the Pheasant Ranch, there's a lot going on. It is, it is a, it's a fun environment. There's a lot of excitement. There's live birds. There's all this going on. There's other dogs. And so I'm, I'm watching a dog have one in mind that, you know, the owner had talked to me about how he's working with, you know, this was not necessarily, um, I'm trying to make sure I'm correct. I don't believe, no, hundred percent. He's not, he's not a retriever of my member, which hopefully he is by now. But, um, he, wh- where I was going with this is, you know, could I speak the same language, which, which I can't, but, um, he would talk about how, you know, he was you know working on blind retrieves, which of course, when you hear somebody say that you don't really ever know what they mean by that. You know, some people blind retrieves is just, they can play baseball in the front yard, you know, first thing, third base casting. Some people is, 
I want this line to be as straight as possible for 200 yards, right? So um, you just never know what that is. This dog, the best way I can describe this dog, I think I've used this, this uh, description before, is like if you took a balloon and like a full balloon and you just like let go of the end and how that balloon goes, you know, all over the place, like that's what this dog was in the field. Just all over the place. We're running out there. There was no rhyme or reason. The guy was whistling. The guy was calling. The guy was, I mean, it was like the dog was all over the place. And, you know, he kept saying to me, like, oh, he's, he's, he's not like this at home. He's not like this at home. He's not like this at home. And, but what he was frustrated with is that he wasn't stopping on the whistle when he asked him to. He was blown off the whistle. And I'm looking at him going, like, dude, like, he's not even walking at heel. Like, how in the world can we expect he's going to stop at on a whistle at 50, 60 yards? And there were times that he was probably 150, 60 yards. Um, how, how are we expecting that when he's not even doing this, right? And it just kept going to, well, you know, he's just not in this environment much. He's not, well, it looks to me like that's what we have to work on. Because ultimately, isn't this what we're going for? We're training for the in-the-field moments. And so... That's great if we can do it during training. That's great if we can do it during setup situations. But when you go into the real thing, if the wheels come off, we have to either add layers of, of training or leave the gun at home and make those hunts live training situations. And um, what I found more often than not was that people just did not, and this, this is through waterfall season too, people do not like keeping the gun at home. They do not like sacrificing those days in the field to make live training days. But it, it, it also makes them want to pull their hair out because they're so frustrated with the situation, but they're also not doing anything to make it better. And it's so interesting to me that, that there's, you know, that there's that, you know, that pull back and forth of like, I want this, but I'm not willing to give up that to get this. If that makes sense. And I, I, I struggle with, I struggle with that because ultimately that comes down, that comes down to you and that comes down to what you ultimately want and what you're looking for. And, um, and that's, that's a handler, that's a handler mentality. And so I, Brad, I don't know if you saw, you know, much of that, but that stood out to me, you know, this season as we traveled. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, uh, I know one instance that we had, uh, a dog in the field and, you know, just even recall. It was uh, struggling with recall, and you know, it's it's the, the reality of it. Josh is you know, the obedience stuff, and you've said it before. The obedience stuff, it's not fun. It's it's not the fun part. It's not the flashy stuff. It's not. It's boring, right? But it's the most important part. Um, you know, everybody wants to speed through it because they want that dog that's going to be running three hundred yard blinds and sitting you know, on a whistle, this, that, and the other. But the reality of it is you have to, you have to go slow in that obedience side of things to reach, you know, to reach those, those high goals that you set for yourself and your dog. And if you don't take the time to do that, you know, off, off the, the get go, or, you know, it's just going to, it's just going to make things more frustrating, you know, going down the line. I still go back to obedience with my dog. There's times that I, you know, would see an issue and it's right back to obedience. Let's work on heel. Let's work on sit. Let's work on whistle sits. You know, um, when I was at strike force, that, that was another thing I was going to add with, you know, just not in the field, but like strike force for, for example, there's a lot of dogs around and there's a lot different stimulations going on. And if your dog's not obedient and running around going crazy, you know, that can end up in, in a in a large situation like that, it it can ruin it for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. So you know, just having that dog under control is huge. But I was gonna say, like I took advantage. I'm working with a young pup now of ours, Ash. Uh, there was multiple times during the strike force that there was just situations that I can't always get her around. A lot of people, a lot of commotion. So I took advantage of that, and we work on heel with all this commotion going on, dogs running around, people talking, music playing. And I took 15 minutes a day and just worked with obedience on it and just took advantage, like I said, of that situation that I may not have all the time. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it just 
that's what it comes down to. Like I said, it's not the it's not the flashy stuff, but I promise you, I you hear more comments of got people going, "Man, you don't even know that dog's here." Mm-hmm. Well, the reason for that is because that dog is very obedient, and you spend a lot of time on that obedience. So having that dog just run around the field, you're constantly calling at him, you're constantly yelling at him, and you have that obedient dog that's next to you, you know, you don't have that embarrassment, so to speak, of, you know, your dog being out of control. Yeah, you know, this is where I just, I firmly believe that this is where social media has really done the dog training world a disservice. And I think there's a lot of positives to be said about it. I think you can find a lot of content. I think you can find a lot of help. I think you can find a lot of direction. But... I think there's this this thought of I want this now and that's not going to happen. I think there's also this um, this perception of I'm trying to say, I'm trying to figure out how I want to say this. There, there's there's a I, I want to show it off perception of I want to be able to show what my dog is doing and showing obedience is not flashy is not fun. But you don't get the other stuff without it. And and the number of times, okay, for example, I have now watched through waterfall season, through strike force, through um, training groups that we've been around over the last six months, the number of people that are trying to handle a dog while videotaping it is mind-boggling. And, and I, I mean, I'm saying that I know that I have to do it at times because we're trying to get content for the business, but that's why if you guys, if you guys follow Riverstone Kennels, you know, a lot of the content that I have is a very stationary camera because I have a arm that had, that I bought specifically to wrap around a tree so I could just hit record and I don't have, because if I'm videotaping, I'm not handling. I watched one person in particular, um, they stopped the dog, the dog turned and looked at them and they wanted to give a left, uh, I can't remember if the left over left angle cast and they had the phone in their left hand. So they move the phone to the right hand. So naturally what happens? Your right hand moves, right? So the dog took, you started going with the hand and started going right. And so they whistled like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, that is not the dog's fault. That, that was a hundred percent a handler error. Right. And it has everything to do with like, what do you, why are we trying to videotape this? Why, why is this so important to get this on camera that you have all of your attention on getting this filmed? Like you, you actually as a handle, you just screwed up your dog. That is your fault, not the dogs. And it's all because you want to have something on social media. I just, I don't understand it. And it's becoming, I think the reason it's more frustrating for me is because I see the lack of obedience that is going into these dogs because it's not fun. It's not. And here's the other thing. There's, there's also, I'm sorry to get off on a little bit of a rant here as you can tell my, my energy level is rising. Um, (laughs) The, uh, the other thing that I really get frustrated with is there's a lack of understanding of time because of social media, I believe. And when I say that, it's like, well, you know, so-and-so's dog is here at X amount months old. Like that's what mine should be at. Who, who says that? Who, who thinks that your dog, even if it's litter mates, why should your dog be on par with, you know, the Smith's dog down the road? Because you guys likely have very different work schedules, very different free time schedules, very different tools that you're using, very different equipment that you're using, very different property that you're using, very different everything. Like, why are you holding yourself to to this standard? Why are you holding yourself to what someone else is doing? Like, do you? This is your bobber. Watch yours. And uh, I, I guess that that's where, for me, that's where I want to really dig into this handler side of it because I believe the mentality that you take into this season is going to be the diff- training season, I mean, is going to be the difference in how successful your training season is. If you are worried about going too fast, I'm just going to say fast because too fast makes it an easy decision. If you're worried about going fast, hitting a timeline, 
you're you're probably going to be disappointed. It's going to add stress. It's going to add frustration, which is going to leak into the dog, which means your relationship isn't going to be what it should be, which means you are likely not going to hit that goal. If you are sitting here with, I got to videotape everything because I have this, this need of everyone seeing what I'm doing, I'm going to say you're probably not going to be as successful as you should be because you're going to skip obedience. You're going to skip getting through some of the things that you should. Bad training sessions or sessions that don't go as planned can sometimes be, not even sometimes, majority of the time, the most productive sessions you can have because it shows you what the weakness is. It shows you what's going wrong. And if you have your eyes open, you can see what it is you need to do to whether it's backtrack, whether it's you know revert, whether it's speak a different language. It shows you what you need to do to take that dog to the next level. You can't do that if when something goes wrong, you're more worried about, oh, I can't use this video now because I don't want people to see you know, the, the, the negative. I don't want them to see that, you know, so-and-so, you know, you know Willie, you did, did it wrong, you know, whatever it is, right? It's, it's like, wh- where is your priority? Where is your heart? Where do you, what do you really want out of this? And knowing that as, as an amateur handler, as the vast majority of people listening to this are, you're already at a, a, uh, I don't want to say a hole, but you're already at a disadvantage. Okay. So I'll use my personal example for this. So as you guys know, if you've listened to this uh, for any amount of time, um, I, I tie down rope uh, so I compete in the uh, professional rodeo circuit. And it's something that I really want to get better at. I really want to be successful. I, I'm spending a lot of time. This is what I do in my free time is I've, I've poured myself into this, whether that's with my workout program, whether that's with my practice schedule, whether that's whatever. I'm pouring myself into this. And uh, I recently uh, bought a new horse probably about six, seven months ago. And I have him right now with a good friend. He's become a really good friend of mine. Um, but he he is he's at the level that I would love to be at. I probably will never be. I just don't know if I can dedicate that kind of time yeah, to competing. But he's, uh, he's top 20 in the world. He, he's a great horse trainer. And so he has my horse and he's training with him. And uh, recently I had him enter him in a few rodeos. And the reason I had him enter him into rodeos is because if something went wrong, right, so you start adding in all the distraction level with crowd noise, with loud music, with all these other horses and people, naturally your energy level is different. That sound familiar? Sound a lot like that hunting situation that we talked about, right? If something goes wrong, he is going to know how to combat it in the moment way better than I'm going to. That's why I want him to enter that. Okay. Just like on a hunt, if we went into the hunt and the dog's wheels came off, I'm going to know way better than majority of people how to combat that in the moment because it's what I do for a living. You know, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of dogs rather than you know one or two, right? So just naturally, I want a chance to enter him in the rodeos because if something went wrong, he knows what to do and how to do it. And um, so I, I'm, I'm in this learning mode. I'm trying to learn everything I possibly can. I'm trying to understand, you know, how to, how to improve, how to get better. But I also know that I am not, and quite frankly, probably never will be the horseman, the chances. And so when we talk about hurricane is my horse's name that he has, when we talk about hurricanes development and he thinks he has a tremendously high potential, a uh, tremendously high ceiling. I told him, I said, you know, we literally had this conversation today. I said, this is why this is so important to me that every winter, when, you know, when I go and start traveling, he's going to go down south with Chance. He's going to spend the entire winter with Chance training. For minimum, the next five years, he's only five now. Minimum next five years. Because I understand this is a long game. I, and I also understand that me not being a professional, I'm going to unravel some of, if not a lot of, what Chance is doing with Hurricane right now. Right, so like the stuff that we went over on the videos of the rodeo, he did fantastic yesterday, by the way, in uh, only his second rodeo ever. Um, but there's some things he needs to work on and what he needs to work through. Like he is still, he's a little distracted. He's, you know, you can tell he's looking around at everything. He's a little wide-eyed, right? That'll, that will come. But like with Chance, 
he's working on all these things. He's going to hand them off to me. And I'm going to be focused more on me roping than him, especially in the rodeos. So naturally, I'm going to regress in where the professional that knows what he's doing, that is doing this every single day with numerous horses, where he's going to get him to. And, and I know that, and I accept that, but I also understand this is a long game, right? So, for example, we, I have this conversation with, you know, dogs come in for the, the advanced program. Dogs are coming into my program for the advanced program, okay? I know that when I send that dog home, even though I'm going to work with the owners a bunch on how to, you know, teach them, how to handle them, how they handle the dog, how to go, I know that this is probably dog one or two or maybe three for them, right? They don't have, you know, 800 under their belt. So naturally, they're not going to know how to maybe combat something in the moment or how, or how to get over a hurdle or what do I do here? And and from a handler standpoint, one, I do believe you have to be a student of the game. I think if you really want to get the most, the absolute most on your dog, you have to be a student. You have to understand how to read the dog. You have to understand how to communicate with the dog. You have to understand if he does this, I do that. You're never going to have all the answers. I'm never going to have all the answers. I promise you I'm doing a tremendous amount to try to be as best of a tight on roper as I possibly can. But I know that I'm never going to you know, be even on top of, let alone train, the number of, of horses that Chance has ever trained. I know I'm never going to have entered the number of rodeos that Chance has ever entered. So will I ever be a top 20 in the world? Probably not. But that doesn't mean that I'm not still going to aspire to. That, that still doesn't mean I'm going to, that's what I'm striving for, that I'm still going to pour myself into to get better, to get to that level so that I can maybe do maybe a fraction of that and do my horse the service that he needs and not regress with him overseas. And so I guess going back to you know the, the dog side of it, I have this conversation with everybody that comes in for the advanced program is, look, like you're not getting this finished robot going home. I have people that send in dogs to the advanced program for two or three or four years in a row because they see the exact same thing that I just talked about. The dog goes home. He does great. He regresses a little bit. All of a sudden we're talking, you know, we're in March. He's like, Oh my gosh, I don't know what happened, but uh, he's not nearly as sharp as he was in, you know, last October. All right, let's go. Let, let's get him back in. We'll sharpen him back up. We'll take another step or two with him. We'll, we'll make him that much better. Right. Again, from a social media standpoint, and I'm at fault for this. I show Brock off. I show Strike off. I show quiet. I show all my dogs off. But what you don't see is the years of work that went into them. I mean, it's literally every single day that we're working. Every day, minimum five days a week. Every day we're working. Oh, and by the way, we have all the equipment we could ever want. We have live birds all the time. We have tech ponds to use. We have all this property. Like we have all these attributes that we can use, and it still takes all these years of development. Like it does not happen overnight. But then all the way back to the beginning, what is the one thing we do every single day? We do obedience every day. Every day. So from a handler standpoint, I, I just truly believe to mentally go into this training season and understand, all right, here are my strengths and weaknesses. Here's what I am trying to get out of this. Here's what I, and like, I'm, I'm great with videotape and I don't want to you know, take that away. I'm great with videotape and training sessions because I think if you're using it to be a student of the game and to look and be like, oh, that's what I look like when I'm handling. Like, look at all the mixed signals I'm sending. I'm like, totally get that. But that's for the right reason. Right. There's, there's, I think there's a lot to that. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to throw in there uh, what you just said right there. It's like, I don't have a problem with, with recording yourself. I think a lot of people need to record themselves, um, you know, from the, from the standpoint of seeing what you are doing, watching your body language, watch to see how you're talking to that dog, not in your hand, but behind you. So you can see you and you can see your dog. And I, you know, even from a casting standpoint, a lot of people, when they think they're given a first base, they're actually given an angle, you know, an angle back. They're not given an actual right over cast. And, you know, and unless you see yourself doing that, you're mentally, when you're in the moment doing it, you're mentally thinking you're given the right cast, but you're actually given an angle back. So I think from a recording standpoint, it's great. 
but don't put it in your hand, put it behind you. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's where the run reviews came from in the retrieval roadmap community. So once you're a member of retrieval roadmap, we have a Facebook community that I do run reviews. I try to do them every, every you know, week or two. It really depends on, on when I'm you know available at a computer, but every couple of weeks we do run reviews. And what that is, is that you can record one of your training sessions, put it up here and I'll critique it. And where that came from was me videotaping myself roping and sending it to these guys that I've developed these friendships with and just be like, man, what can I do better? And man, they would pick apart stuff that I wouldn't even be looking at, right? Like I wouldn't even be looking at what my left hand would do. And I wouldn't even looking at, you know, where, where my, my right shoulder was compared to my left, where like all these things that they dug into, that's because this is what they do. Like they, they're so much more advanced than I am at this, that if I can send this to them and they can pick me apart, that's great. That's what I want. I want to go get better. I want to take all that. Then I want to go try to apply it. And that's how, how the running views happen because, you know, I want to be able to help you take this and go, okay, what do I, do? How, how, what's going wrong here? What do you see? What, what don't I see? And it's crazy the number of times that I'll pick something out. And to me, it's obvious, but the other response, oh my gosh, I didn't even notice that. And so I think the video stuff is so, so valuable. I just think doing it for the right reason is, is incredibly important because, um, you know, the, the, it, it's just, I, I do understand it. I, I get that, you know, the social media stuff is a big deal for a lot of people. I really, really do. Um, it's it just, I, I just question when it impedes your progress with your dog or your communication level with your dog. I just really question like, where's the line there? You know, where, where do we, where do we draw the line of like, Hey, like let's, let's put the phone down. Let's just do a couple sessions without, um, but so much of it always goes back to the, you know, the obedience side. Obedience, obedience, obedience. Mm -hmm. Can't hammer that enough. That's right. That's right. Um, all right. So I have to get back to the kennel here uh, quickly because we have an appointment. But before I do that, I want to go over a few uh, dog bowl questions. Um, and I don't know what these are. So, Brett, these may apply to you and they may not. But we'll see what this <laughs> looks like here. So. All right. All right. So one, uh, in the off season, when you are not training, how do you spend your free time? Well, <laughs> you probably know now <laughs> from, from, uh, this episode, but, um, the big one for me is, is currently it's, it's roping. Um, it, what's fun for me about the roping side of it is it allows me to have a goal and to strive for something that is outside of work. And I struggled with this for a long time because, you know, for me competing was hunt tests or for me competing was field trials, but it was still work. And, um, I, I don't think I was maybe as, as understanding as I should have been of how it was affecting my family that I, when I say my family, Whitney at the time, but then, you know, Ava, you know, my daughter as you know, she entered our family that I'd be working five days a week. And then I'd be going to work some more on the weekends and I would come back and work right again. And, um, I just, I didn't have an off switch. And so for me, the rodeos are something that we can go do as a family. We can enjoy together because my family loves these horses as much as I do. And they, they'll trail ride and they love the rodeo environment. And it's, it's a fun hangout thing for the family. Um, but for me, it's, it fills a competitive side that was missing, you know, from me. And, uh, and so that's, that's what I love to do. Um, you know, outside of that, archery hunting is probably my biggest, my biggest one. But, um, Brett, what about you? What do you like doing in your free time? I'm a golfer. So I like in the summertime when I'm not training, I like to, uh, I like to golf. Uh, this is something, you know, I've done most of my life and, uh, I, I just enjoy it. It's, it's nice to get out there in the fresh air. Yes, it can be frustrating. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy that. And then, you know, right now, I sent you a snap yesterday, but uh, my son's in track. So track season just started. Yesterday was the first meet. So we're going to be following him around quite a bit to all these track meets. And that's my, my free time, family, and a little golf. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love it. All right, let's do one more here. So, uh -oh. all right. Um <laughs> 
advice for working with your spouse? I feel like we could take this a lot of different ways. Um, I, I'm going to avoid the, how do you train your spouse, you know, side of it. Uh, Cause I'm not going to go down there. Um, so let, let me kind of go into this though. Uh, very seriously. This is very often a hurdle when it comes to our dogs at home. And the reason I say that is because generally speaking, one of the spouses is very in tune and very detailed with this is the regiment. This is how I want to go about this. The dog, you know, whether it stays in this room, is allowed in this room, is not in this room, is not given that food, is given this food. Well, you know, these are the commands. These are not. One of the spouses is usually very regimented with that, and one of them usually really isn't. And I promise you, it's not always the guys are and the girls aren't. And quite frankly, I think the gals are probably more regimented and give less leeway than the guys do in most cases that I see. And so when I see that, you look at that as the dog is getting mixed signals all the time. Quite frankly, and this is something, again, from a, a handler mentality, we should understand this, is that when our dogs are in the home with us all the time, they are presented with gray area all day long. They feed off of your energy all day long. If you get frustrated or mad because of a phone call at work, that dog feeds off of that. What happens when you go right outside after you're, you're frustrated and the dog is like, oh gosh, like dad's really upset today. Oh gosh, now we're going to go train. And then you're sitting there going, oh, what's wrong with the dog? Right? Well, like there's a lot you have to be said there, but from a spouse standpoint, um, or quite frankly, kids are a huge deal on this. The more mixed signals that that dog, especially young dog receives on a daily basis, the less in tune you are probably going to feel when you're out training. And we see this a lot specifically over the winter because there's less, generally speaking, especially over here in the north, there's less to do outside, which means we're inside more often, which means we're in with the dog more often, which means we're not outside probably training with the dog as often as we should be. And then we come off of three, four months being stuck inside by the fireplace. We go outside and you're like, what the world? Like, what's going on? The, the consistency is huge. The more consistent that you can be with your family, especially when that dog is in the house, the clearer life is going to be for that dog. I think that's very, very important. Brad, any advice for training your spouse? <laughs> I would agree 100. percent Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's it's tough. Um, I mean you've got four kids at home. That's what's really challenging, especially when you bring a puppy home. You know, everybody wants to ooh and all the puppy and. Everybody thinks the puppy's theirs and they want to spend their time with the puppy. Uh, it, it's very challenging and it's, it's tough to get everybody on the same page because the moment you step away, the, Oh, they, you know, they're so cute and so cuddly and that's where things start going. You know, they can go, like you said, it's very unclear. So trying to be on the same page, you know, just set the expectations when, when the puppy comes home and, uh, Especially being in the house, it's a lot. It's a lot harder because you know that puppy tries to jump up on the couch, and if you know one wants him on the couch and the other one doesn't, you know it's just just trying to get on the same page and understanding. Okay, if you're going to give a little bit, then understand the expectations and you know, understand that you know things are going to be a little unclear. Things may take a little longer. You're not going to have that you know that dog that boom 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 because you're giving them mixed signals. But yeah, it's just trying to get everybody on the same page from day one. And again, you as a handler, if you are the handler in the family and everybody else is, I want to give the dog, you know, treats under the table. I want to, you know, let them on the furniture when they're not supposed to behind your back when they, you know, like understanding that this is family stuff, but also understanding like what is the ultimate role of the dog in the family? I think for most of us being a part of the family is probably the number one priority, which means we have to be willing to accept that, Training sessions probably aren't going to be as sharp as they should be all the time. Progress isn't probably going to go as fast as you really want it to be all the time. But if the dog is checking the box of what your ultimate number one box is, then I'd say, you know, that, that that's an easier pill to swallow in that case. So, um, again, mentality, like your mental approach, I think is so crucial in, in how this goes. Why it's so crucial is that the, the, if we are frustrated with our dogs, whether that's because of a session, whether it's because of progress, whether it's because of, of you know, bad habits, whether it's because 
it's, it's how we respond to that adversity that is going to be the difference between how successful our dog ends up being and how it's not. So that's my challenge you guys here this week is just, you know, mentally take a breath, figure out how you want to approach the season and then go into it with a game plan. We talked about that so much, but go into this year with a plan of this is how you want to you know, combat the season. This is what your goals are. So, um, so I got to jump off here so I can get back to the kennel for a uh, an appointment. Uh, Brett, thank you so much for spending the time uh, here today with me to go over all this. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. And it's always a, it's always a fun time having conversations about dogs. For sure, for sure. All right, buddy, we'll have a great rest of the day. And all of you guys out there, have a fantastic rest of your day, a fantastic rest of your week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Leave us a review on iTunes. And a special thank you to Yukonuba because without them, we couldn't do what we do here, bringing this information to you.